If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn to me to the great book of Ephesians in the New Testament, the writings of Paul, the Ephesian church. And by the way, if you're here tonight for the first time, we welcome you. And uh, if you haven't yet gotten acquainted with this church, it is a church that is on the move, a church that love is building and literally people from all walks of life, every age and from backgrounds, it's just amazing to see what God is doing. And on Sunday mornings, we are absolutely in the middle of a flow of God. How many have understood that this year it's just been a flow of God? His word is going forth with power. And our church is growing. I don't know if you've looked around on Sunday mornings especially. Uh, there are people that are coming from everywhere, from the tri-state area. And I look from and just see that, that we're fulfilling the scripture when he said, Lord, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. And in heaven there's every race, color, kindred, and tongue. And that just overjoys my heart to see what he's doing at Princeton Pike. And I'm glad you're here tonight. And we're going to continue the journey. If you've been with us on Wednesday nights through January through the present, we're on a series called uh, The Love Walk. How many understand that you can walk this thing out? And we are learning very simply but very biblically what it means to walk in the love of God. This love walk is something that is real, that is tangible, that is personal, listen, and that can change your life, and it can change my life, and it is changing our lives as we walk one moment, one day, one week at a time. How many understand you take one step at a time to get where you're going? And uh, just because you know Christ doesn't make you a superhuman being. It makes you a follower of Christ. It makes you a Christian. But it does not make you superhuman being. So we have to walk this thing out practically every day of our life. Walking with him, making time for him, and knowing that as we take time to read his word, to listen to his voice, everybody to say, look around you. Just look around you. Every day the Lord is using any means by all means to communicate the message of his love to us. And I don't know about you, but several Sundays ago I urged you to pick a trigger in your life that reminds you every day of your life how much your creator, your God, loves you. Not just a little bit, but he loves you very, very, very much. And I mentioned for me it's the cardinal. Every time I see a cardinal, I just say, God, thank you for, for creating that bird and reminding me. And how many understand that when I made that confession, all of a sudden I start seeing cardinals every day of my life. Do you realize God has a sense of humor? He's just waiting for his creation to invite him to reveal himself and to know himself. And somebody said, well, what does, what does that look like? How many understand you can be in a room and be present and no one know that you're there? Let me see your hand. You can do that. And you can be present among many people and they not even know your name. And it comes not accidentally but intentionally that if you're going to walk with God, it's an intentional walk. It's an invitational walk. It's saying, God, every day of my life, I, I want to know you. I, Pastor Ann, I don't want to be satisfied with just being a Christian. That is important to have that, that peace and assurance. But ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. Being a Christian is not the crest or not the height of your journey. It is the foundation. It is the launching pad. It is the peace and the promise that comes with God's gift to you, where the Bible, the Bible said it is not the works that we're saved, but it's the gift of God, lest any man should us. We are saved, and that is the gift of God. But somebody say that's the beginning of the journey. That's not the ending of the journey. The, listen, don't ever get into a rut where you as a follower of Christ and a Christian think that the greatest moment of your life is just the fact that you got saved. Here I am, and I'm waiting for Jesus to come and get me. From here to heaven... There is so much to be experienced. And listen, if God was finished with you already, you wouldn't be here tonight. How many understand that? So you're here tonight, and that means that God is not finished with you, and he has something that he wants you to walk out in love. Well, Ephesians chapter 3, last week we kind of walked through Ephesians chapter 5, but I want to go to Ephesians chapter 3 tonight and go to verse 17. As you look at the scripture Paul is writing, and this is what he says. He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts. He is praying for the Ephesian church. This was his prayer. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And I want you to underline this. That ye being rooted and grounded in what? Somebody say that word with me. Notice he did not say being rooted and grounded in wisdom. Wisdom is, is, is an absolute wonderful thing but that's not what he chose to pray 
He didn't ask for the gifts of the Spirit. He said, be rooted and grounded in love. Shout that word with me again. Love. Now, I want to just quiz this for a moment so we understand we're not talking about a hallmark love that changes with Hollywood's definition. The love of which you're speaking with is the agape love of God, the unconditional, the unlimited, the unchanging love of God. I mean, understand if you're going to put something in soil and want it to grow, that, 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 that you have to look very carefully and consider the soil that you're planting, that seed or that planting. Let me see your hand. The, the soil is important to the nurturing of that seed and to the growing of that plant. So as the soil, so with the growth of that seed or that plant be. And I think what Paul is saying is here is pay attention to the soil of which, you're, which you are planting your life and your faith. Being rooted and grounded in love. And then he continues in verse 18. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and the depth, and the height. Here it is again, verse 19. And to know what? The love of Christ which passeth what? Knowledge that we might be filled. Now I want to stop here and just ask yourself the question. This is a practical question. Everybody look at your pastor. This is not a church question. This is a lie question. Do you want to live a half empty life or do you want to live a filled and overflowing life? Look at me ladies and gentlemen. Circumstances do not get to make that choice. You do. I do. We get to choose whether we live half empty or half full. But by by chance, don't think for a moment that that is just God's promise to some and not to others. There is a scriptural promise to living a fulfilled life in Jesus Christ. I want to read verse 19 again. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be, what? Filled with the fullness of God. And then I love this scripture, one of my favorite. He closes that prayer by saying, now unto him. That is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think according to the what? Power that works where? In us. And then he doesn't stop there. He could have said, amen, so be it. But it's incomplete without this verse. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now, I want to talk about pursuing this love walk with Christ. Every week we are learning the stepping stones of this journey, one step at a time. Last week we walked into the Ephesians chapter 5 and we learned what he said concerning the love of God. But this week, I want us to back up a little bit and consider that from this prayer that we have heard in our hearing, what it is that Paul is saying over the church is that he wants us to live a full life. Now, how many know that you can live life but not live it full? He said, but then I want you to consider what you fill your life with. This is a question worth of writing down and for you to consider, ponder, pray through, and answer in your daily journey. What am I allowing my life to be filled with? I'm going to ask some questions tonight. I hope you'll write them down. What is it that I am allowing my life daily to be filled with? Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me very carefully. Your faith is not compromised on what you get on Sunday and Wednesday. If so, it will lead to a deficient way of life. You'll live between the pastor's message and a Wednesday teaching, and somewhere in the middle of it all, you become anemic to what you really need because everything parallels with the body. Are you listening to me? If you have to eat every day to keep your body strong, what must you do every day to keep your faith strong in Christ? We must learn to walk in Him, to read and to study and to and to pray and to feed our faith. Somebody touch your neighbor and say, it's okay to feed your faith. Whatever we allow our life to be fed, that is what we become. Come on, somebody. Now, many people can look to a Sunday morning and say, man, I love the message preached. That was good eating. But what are you eating the other six days of the week that determines who you become in Christ? What you do in Christ? And what you as an individual purpose as you walk out your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to know that nothing that you read in the scripture here is by accident. In fact, for a moment, if you'll allow me to challenge us not to look at the scripture with verse and chapter. And I know that's the way it's written. But the Lord challenged me in my study one day. He said, quit looking at chapters and verses and start looking at it as a road map, a continuation 
And all of a sudden I found something. When I removed numbers and chapters, I began to see things come together like pieces of a puzzle instead of choosing and picking my fate. Listen, it's this, we do it in the church all the time. Instead of picking and choosing my favorite verses and things I like and want to hear, I began to walking through every step of the scripture realizing that one connects to the other. And many times what we quote is the end result of what we want in the promises of God, but then it's what we don't read, we don't accept, we don't believe that is the equation that produces that result. Are you listening to me? So you can't just read over scripture. You've got to walk it out. Turn to your neighbor and say, you've got to walk it out. You've got to walk out through the scripture because in not doing so, you may miss, listen, you may miss the very element of what the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate. And in so doing, hell doesn't care how much scripture that you learn to read in life, just so long as it does not connect with you to a place where you can walk out what you've read. How many understand that? So as I begin to read this, chapter 3 means there's a chapter 4. Instead of seeing it as a chapter, I keep walking past the prayer and I walk in to what for reference only would be chapter 4 verse 1. And this is what he said. Paul said, I am the prisoner of the Lord and I beseech you that you walk, here's that word again, that you walk worthy of the vocation by wherewith you are called. I want everybody to write this in your notes tonight and I want you to make a confession with me. I am called by the Lord. You see, in our culture, we tend to think that callings are only delegated to pastors, preachers, teachers, and singers. But Paul speaks of a calling and a vocation, and he attaches these words to it that we cannot negate nor dismiss. He said, walk worthy. Somebody say, walk worthy. worthy. Say that with me again. Say it again. Walk Walk worthy. Now, how many know that if you're depending on yourself, there is nothing in us that is worthy? You see, this is the difference between egos and logos and the presence and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember when Paul was closing out his prayer? He said, unto him be glory. Somebody just say that with me. Unto him be glory. Paul had walked enough through life to see its ups and downs and knew who he was and who he became with Christ, never to forget that that he couldn't do anything without this Christ. Paul the Apostle, he ended his prayer not just as a conclusion, but something that should be thought-provoking unto me. He said, unto him be glory. Let me ask you a question tonight. What do you do in your life that brings glory to God? The Scripture says, in everything that you do, do it as unto the Lord. Now, I want you to consider that for a moment. That speaks to motivation. I want you to say that word with me, motivation. Say it again. That speaks to our motivation as to why we do what we do in his name. There are people who say, I go to church, but what's your motive? There's people that said, well, I've, I've done good today and I've helped people. What was your motive? Because you see, the Bible said that God weighs the thoughts in the heart of men. It's not just our actions, but it's our motive that determines how we walk this faith out. And you'd be surprised how many people do things in the name of God when their heart is not in it, but they're doing it to satisfy their cultural conscience. And we lose the joy of the journey. How many understand that God didn't intend this journey to be, uh, to, to be a, a flat line and to be without life? In fact, that, uh, John chapter 10 said, I've come that you might have life and have it what? More abundantly. Somebody say it with me, more abundantly. So listen, ladies and gentlemen, if we are walking out this abundant life, then there must be something in this journey that causes this life to be more abundant. You say, Pastor, what what, what does that look like on an everyday level besides Sunday and Wednesday? What does that look like in my faith walk? Well, let's see what he says. He says, walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. First of all, you've got to accept the fact I am called by God. Say that with me. I am called by God. But it's how and what you're called with. In verse 2, he said, you're called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in what? Here's that word again. In love. Notice he says, 
that it's not that you're just called, it's what you're called in. You're called in the spirit of lowliness and meekness with long suffering and forbearing. Those all bleed into the same potting soil. He said, all of these, one another in what? Love. And here it is. Don't you miss verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now I'm going to stop here for the next probably 10 minutes and talk to you about the number one biblical principle of which hell hopes you will never find out embrace and practice and it's the protecting of the unity of the faith in Acts chapter 2 he gives us insight as to what produces the supernatural he said in Acts chapter 2 when they were all together everybody say they were together in one mind and in one accord Acts chapter 2 look at Acts chapter 2 and you begin to read the story which was the beginning of a fulfilled promise the reason I point back to Acts chapter 2 is so that we can look at the pattern of a New Testament church. He said to that church, I am giving you a promise. If you go and you tarry in Jerusalem, he said, I want you to stay there until you be endued with what? Power, which that word means dunamis in the Greek, dynamite. How many dynamite can do a lot of things you can't do? He said, I'm giving you spiritual dynamite, power to become the sons and the daughters of God. But then notice the environment of which that promise was produced. I want you to understand right now, God makes promises and he keeps his word. Whether you receive his promises or not is contingent on the environment that you create. If you create an environment of doubt, faith cannot work on your behalf. Are you listening to me? If you allow an environment of division then even the Holy Spirit cannot override your will. Why? Because God is not a dictator. He is a creator. He is not looking for clones. He is looking for those who created to surrender their will to His will. That's why Jesus in the garden didn't want to bear the cross. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. There is an act of personal submission that perceives promises of God fulfilled. I want to say that again. There, 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 is this, there is this act of submission and surrender that precedes God's promises fulfilled. You would say, what well, God said, never negate what God said is contingent upon what you will do. You have to be willing to surrender to receive the fulfillment of his promise. And I want you to notice this. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible said there was a condition to that promise. He said, they were all together in one place, in one mind, and in one accord. And the next word you find is this. And suddenly, there came a sound from where? Isn't it amazing? The sound from heaven was preceded by a conditional environment that those who were in it created. Now, I'm going to preach right again. Everybody wants the empowerment and the work of the Holy Spirit. But notice that the timing of his introduction, his entrance and fulfilled promise was to first bleed out those who were unsurrendered. 500 people came into the upper room of Acts chapter 2. But at the moment the sound from heaven was heard and cloven tongues of fire set upon 120 people in that room. The Bible said it filled the whole house. But have you ever considered one-third of those who were given the same command and with the same promise? One-third did not even receive the same promise. Not because that God left them out. It's because they removed themselves from what he had asked of them. God had to allow the atmosphere to come to a place where those who that were left were in one place, one mind, one accord. In fact, what the Greek word says, they were together, together. Somebody say that with me. They were together, together together which means you can't get any closer in uni unity than they were and in that unified atmosphere the Holy Spirit bore witness to the promise and he came upon them I want to read this for you again he said endeavoring to keep the unity everybody say this is a priority not an option priority. this is not buffet 
faith. This is not multiple choice. This is not ratio two out of three. This is the priority of every fulfilled promise. You need to write that down. This is the priority of every fulfilled promise of God. The atmosphere and the womb of your faith must be conducive to the conception of what God wants to do in your life. A medical doctor will tell a woman, your womb has to be at the, at the, at the right phys physical condition. The conditions have to be right for conception to follow. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. Don't allow the enemy to paralyze your faith as to pretend that you just wait passively on God for him to fulfill the promises of his word in your life while you sit and do nothing. We have something that hell hopes we never find out, neither that we become protectors of, protectors of and that is the unity of the faith. Somebody say unity. Now I'm going to teach you a few things about unity in these next few moments. The Bible in the Psalms says how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Unity. The psalmist David said it is like the anointing that is on Mount Hermon. He said, it is the analogy, the anointing is like the oil that ran down Aaron's beard, even to his garments, to his feet. He spoke of a direction of the anointing. And here's what that psalm says. He says, this anointing produces the blessing. Everybody say, the blessing. Even life evermore. He didn't say a blessing. He said, it produces the blessing. And you say, what, what is so powerful about the words that he spoke? How pleasant it is for brethren to do what? Dwell together in unity. unity. And then he says, it is like the anointing that is on Aaron's beard. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon. Somebody said, I don't understand the, 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 the importance of that. Let me explain to you. You see, Mount Hermon was a place that in the low valleys, when they were in drought and there was no water that could be found... You could always go in biblical times to Mount Hermon, regardless of the environment that was taking place on this level, you could always be assured that when there was water nowhere else, there was always dew on Mount Hermon. And that, that anointing produced a flow. How many understand that water don't run uphill? Let me see your hand. He's describing the flow of God. How God operates. God doesn't operate from... From, from those who are, are contrite and those who are opposing to him, he works down. Those who surrender to him. The Bible said to the, to the height of Mount Hermon, there was a flow. And I don't have time to do this study tonight, but if you study the flow of Mount Hermon, Mount Hermon, there was a small trickle that created into the valley. And from that valley, it ran into a river and the river that ran into an ocean. But it started where? on Mount Hermon. The anointing that came down Aaron's beard, everybody said, started with his head. When they anointed kings of that day, guess what they anointed first? They anointed their heads, and here's what he was teaching us. What the highest place of your life that you allow God to anoint will affect everything below it. No, 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 no. Yeah, I'm going to teach this one. The highest place that you allow the Holy Spirit to anoint your life will determine how far he can flow through you. Some people have a head knowledge, but they have no heart knowledge. They said to God, I will embrace you in my thoughts and my thinking, but I will not surrender my heart to you because one change, oh, I'm going to say this, because one changes how you speak, the other changes how you live. When God comes into a person's heart, he doesn't just give you an additional thinking process. He changes your life. And through that changed life, we surrender to him. Not as Savior only, but everybody says, Lord, I want you to write these two words down because they're powerful. Savior and Lord. Somebody say Savior and Lord. Most people would not debate the fact if they've accepted Christ that I've accepted my, the Lord as, as, as my Savior. It means that he paid a price for the penalty of my sin. I have acknowledged that what he did for me was enough. 
And by grace, I received that gift of his sacrifice so that the penalty that I could not pay, he paid with his blood and with his life, death, burial, and his resurrection redeemed. Because wherever there's a crucifixion without a resurrection, there can be no redemption. There's on, oh, come on, somebody. The only way that one can be redeemed is to resurrect from where they have died. And only Jesus has done that. I accept his redemptive plan. Therefore, I am saved and he is my Savior. But have you considered in your love walk? Ah, this is good stuff. That I've embraced him not only as the one who saved me, but he is the Lord of my life. There's quite a difference, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know of anybody in my life that don't, didn't say, hey, I'm glad I'm saved. But the saved life becomes a surrendered life. I want you to say that with me. A saved life becomes a surrendered life. So that he doesn't just become my redeemer. He becomes Lord over all of my life. Which means I have surrendered control of every area of my thoughts, of my decisions, of my past, my present, and my future. I trust the one who saved me to lead me. I want everybody to see this before I, before I bring this teaching to a conclusion tonight. I wonder if that may be where many Christians are missing the joy of the journey. Because we have checked off the religious list of to-dos. I am a sinner. I have asked for forgiveness. Check. I am saved. I love God with all of my heart, so I come to his house to worship. And that's what Christians do. Check. I am redeemed. But how many are discipled after having made the greatest decision that one can ever make for life or eternity, and that is to give your heart to Christ, is then to learn how to follow him. I'm teaching better than I'm better than I prepared tonight, but listen to me carefully. Notice the call of every disciple when Jesus was walking the earth. Take up your cross, forsake all, and notice the three components of his invitation. When he said to them, Take up your cross, forsake all, was the invitation to know him. But to follow him was an invitation that demanded more than just checking in. It meant that I am going to surrender my past, my present, and my future so that it's not about, him. oh, I'm on side. God, I just saw this in the Spirit. It's not as much about Him coming into me as me coming into Him. Did you just get a picture of that? It's one thing when you can imagine this God of glory coming into your heart and into your life. But how many know that the greater glory is when you choose to surrender that, Lord, I just don't want you to come into me. Help the all of me to come into all of you. Here's what that looks like. It's the difference between you jumping. Oh, hallelujah. Drink. Anybody got a water bottle? You got a water up there? Everybody ever had a water? Here's a water right here. Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to accept you as Lord and Savior. How many has ever took this kind of drink before? Your soul's thirsty, so you drink of it. What happened to that water? It went inside of me. Lord, I need your healing. He is my healer. So we receive him, and we receive his promises, and we believe him, and we receive that word. Where did that word go? Inside of me. There comes a moment in your walk with God where you say, Lord, thank you. But what would happen if what is inside of me goes to the Atlantic Ocean? There's no way that I could stand at the Atlantic Ocean and open my mouth, even though some of you may be in agreement. My mouth is quite big. <laughs> but the reservoir of my soul is not that huge. That I could open my mouth and invite the Atlantic Ocean to fill my life. How many understand there's more of the Atlantic Ocean than there is of me? But it's possible for me to go to its deepest depths and to, oh, I just feel something in me right now. 
and to jump into the deepest depth that when I look toward the east, I cannot see its ending. And when I look to the west, I cannot begin to dream of where it starts. And when I look behind me, I lose sight of land. All I know is that everything is around me and everything that is beneath me and everything that is over me is greater than me. And ladies and gentlemen, when you see that portrait of faith, you just begin to see the thimble of how much God loves you. Boy, that's a, raise your hands in this place. Hallelujah. Lord, take that imagery that we have just shared. And I pray that not one person who's received you as Lord and Savior, not one individual, God, in this place who is struggling through life, broken in heart, battling issues, would see themselves somehow drinking from a small cup, thinking, Lord, if you can just give me enough to get through tomorrow or through next week or through next month. Oh, God, I pray that you will erase what man has painted on the portrait of our heart as to your love for us. And, Lord, may we receive the new image. And that, Lord, is that there is no way we can know the depth and the height, the width, the breadth, Everybody look at your pastor as we prepare to conclude. Verse 18 said, May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height. It's connected to the next verse. And to know the... What is he talking about? The length, the breadth, the depth. He's talking about the next verse. To know the love of Christ. And I'm going to turn you on to something. Here's how you begin to understand if it's religion that you're diving to or if it's God's love that you're walking in. Here's the difference. This, this is the barometer. This is how you can know. If what you have walked in, joined up, and been a part of is something you can explain, then you know that it's not God. It may be good, but it's not God. Because here's what he said. This love surpasses what? What did he say? Not understanding. He said it surpasses all knowledge. Good Lord God, that you may be filled. Anybody just get a trade in from the eight ounce bottle of water of faith to an, an ocean's gathered, that you will be filled where? All the fullness. Everybody say all the fullness of God. Now, now you're ready for a now moment. Pastor, I don't know how I'm going to make it. But now, when you understand, Jennifer, that you are filled with the fullness of Him, this next word is not just a hallmark conclusion. He said, now. Touch your neighbor and say, now. You know why you couldn't say this? Because you are not ready for it now. But when you begin to change your thinking and your walking and your understanding of Christ, it's not as much as Him and me, it's me and Him. And He has control of my life. And listen, he is not my resource. He is a source. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and they that everything is His. He said, the silver and the gold is mine. If my faith can only get in sync with His heart to not doubt, to believe that everything I need is in Him. All of a sudden, I stand back up from what I'm going through. I poke my chest out, get my confidence back, and I don't just read the verse. I become the verse. Now, somebody shout that with authority. Now, unto Him, to Him that is able, to Him that is able to do what? Exceedingly. To Him that is able to do what? Abundantly. To Him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above? Everybody take your hands like this and say, above all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. That I can more. I've read that a hundred times in my life, but never has it become more alive than it is right now. Some people say, Lord, do you know what I'm thinking? He said, I'm so far beyond your thinking. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, do you know how I feel? He's so far ahead of us. How we feel. I feel the Holy Spirit here. He's wanting to take some of us by the hand tonight and say, let me 
walk you. Let me walk with you through this. He said, unto him be glory in the church. How are we going to do this? Everybody say, with lowliness. How are we going to walk this thing out with meekness? How are we going to get through this with long-suffering? And how are we going to treat one another? Forbearing one another how? In him, in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let me ask you a question. Who's the Prince of Peace? Jesus. So the bond of peace is not this euphoric feeling. It is the person of who he is when he speaks of the bond of peace. He's not talking about a euphoric feeling. He is talking about a person keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of who he is. I made this statement to the council of this church the first week that I was here. And I've kept the mantra and the mission close to my heart. There will never be something that becomes so important in the life of this church and my walk as the leader here that becomes more important than you. And when what becomes more important than you seems to divide us, then I have made a commitment and a sold out promise to God that I will pull back and I will wait on Him. Come on, somebody. So that the unity of the faith and the bond of peace is protected in this house because wherever you can find the bond of peace, you can find the reign of His promises reigning on His people. There will be another Acts chapter 2 for your life and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. I was sitting at work having a cup of coffee, but I have kept my... Come on, somebody. I'm going to protect the unity of the faith. I'm going to protect the unity. I'm going to... Listen, I'm going to protect the presence of God in my life. And if hell can ever bring division in your thinking, division in your life, division in your walk, then he has separated you from the potential of walking in the reality of that suddenly of the promises of God. But wherever you find that somebody, you might be a part of the minority, the 120, that one third of popularity and political correctness may have spoken at your workplace or at your family table, got out and left and made you feel alone. But don't be moved by your environment. Make your daily mission. I'm going to protect the presence of God in my life. I may not be popular at school, but I'm going to protect the presence of God in my life. I may not be voted on to be in a position because of what people think, but I'm going to protect the presence of God in my life. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Stand, stand to your feet. It's 8 o'clock. Stand to your feet. This is good teaching tonight. It amazes me in church culture how much we pursue, but how little we protect. That's good writing down. How much we pursue, but how little we protect. Sunday morning I read from the Proverbs when he said, guard your heart. Guard your heart. We live in a day everybody wants to emphasize the thinking of man, but not the being of man. The Bible said everything comes from the abundance of the heart. That's why this country can't be fixed with a Democrat or a Republican. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care how many millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars that we expend on problems that are causing our culture to decay like heroin and moms and dads leaving children out on the street homeless listen you can't fix that with a program you fix it with a heart that surrenders to God because when the heart is right your actions become right what we're trying to do is throw money at a problem that only redemption can fix oh you need to write that down you cannot throw money at a problem that only redemption can fix it's amazing what happens when we protect our hearts all of a sudden, God begins to speak more clearly. We can hear Him. It's not that He's never spoken. It's that for the first time, we protected the gates of our life that don't allow the things to come in to distract and to debate His voice. Holy Spirit, right now, take us by the hand. Lord, you already have us by the heart. May we take you by the hand tonight and walk with Holy Spirit, come. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
I want everybody when I say move, I want you to do this because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate verses 3 through 6 without even preaching it or teaching it. On the count of three, when I say move together, without delay, I want you to come and walk together as one to the front for a closing prayer. Are you ready? One, two, three. Walk together. While you're walking, let me show you what protecting the unity of faith is like. Jeff, the older I'm getting, I'm realizing that your body talks to you. Can I get a witness from some gray hair out there somewhere? Your body talks to you. I never paid attention to, to some things until all of a sudden your body begins to talk to you. Your knees begin to talk to you. You never had a conversation with your knees until all of a sudden you find out they ache. I like what you said to me one day. You said, Pastor, I get up in the mornings and sometimes my shoulder's hurting so bad, but I speak to my shoulder and tell it to cut it out because the rest of my body's feeling fine and it has work to do. Amen. Get on board. Isn't that good? I like the response it taught me as a, as a pastor that we can be paralyzed and polarized by the one part of our life that's not working well and leave out all the other healthy parts that want to do their job. That's why he said this is what unity is like to the body. He said there is one body, one spirit. Even you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. You see, here's what I'm learning about this faith walk, this love walk. When His love is living through my life the way it should, it connects to your calling. You're not called to do what I do and I'm not called to do what you do. But we're not called to divide ourselves and to be in opposition so that somebody can sit on the throne and everybody applaud my gift. We are called like the heart to the lungs. Hello heart, hello lungs. You don't have a heartbeat without a breath, but you can't have a breath without a heartbeat. I'm preaching to somebody. I'm speaking to somebody who's polarized your calling to, I only like prophecy. If they ain't teaching prophecy, I can't function. You're religious. Because he said we are one body, jointly fit together. We didn't fit each other together. He fit each other. But you know what I found? You can have the lungs and the heart, but what good is the lungs and the heart? Come on, somebody. Unless you have all of the other organs put together and put in form, and even that toe that you think don't mean anything, it brings balance to your stability, to your walk. Come on, somebody. Um, I've got a whole message, the little toe religion. My grandmother, in her elder years, she had to have both of her smallest toes removed, one on each foot. She said to me, I never thought they served a purpose until they were removed. She'd be walking down the hallway and she'd be stumbling, sometimes like a drunk lady. You know why? Because there was purpose in that little toe. Touch somebody and say, you are something big to God. You may not think it. You may not see it. I want you to join somebody by the hand and say, we are jointly fit together. Here's how the body works, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I'm going to do this. as Y'all got a crazy preacher. You already know it. But I want somebody on this backside to just simply pull the hand a little bit of the person beside you and just do a chain reaction and here's let me tell you here's how you know what's working on that end and everybody's connected is if it makes its way to that end how many does it take for it not to lose the for it to lose the flow how many let me ask you a question you're going to be that one that stands in the way of God's letting his love flow through you and what you may not understand in this concluding illustration just one person saying God I'm not going to speak to them I'm not going to forgive them. I'm not going to tell them that I love them. I'm not going to show a demonstration of your love. can become a disconnect in what your physical eyes cannot see into your future. That one little decision could have affected 300. That's pretty good. I almost got you, didn't I? 300. So who will be the first? Are you ready? On the count of three, go.
One, two, three. It shouldn't take but 60 seconds for it to go from one to the other. Just pull the person beside you, and as you pull, pull the other. And they're going to, go ahead, I see it, go ahead, pull the other. And it should just make a flow like electricity flowing through a body, like water flowing through a canal. Who's going to be, don't delay. Where, I, I see it. Where's it at? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Oh, that, that, it's about to hit us around here somewhere. Keep going, keep going, keep going. If you're not connected, you better connect to somebody. There it goes. There it goes, there it goes, there it goes. you got to move yourself to connect to the next. Oh, this is good stuff right here. Are you going to let him flow through your life? But it can't stop with you. It's got to find its way. Come on, somebody. There, God, some of you haven't moved this much in 12 years since I've been here. Oh, keep going. It's going from one way. Who will be the next? It can't just stop. Go. Go. Yep. Notice it came back across because there were some people that were left out. Come on back around here. Do it again. Come on, somebody. How many of you hadn't got a tug yet? Let me see your hand. Oh, there's somebody left out in the body. Are you going to stop them from being blessed? Somebody up here that got a tug needs to pass it on until they get it. Come on, go, go, go. Who are you going to tug? Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. Notice it went a lot of different directions, but God's saying, I got to get everybody flowing together. Now let me ask you a question. Be honest. Don't be religious. How many didn't feel that tug? You didn't get a tug. Is there anybody here who didn't get that tug? If you received that tug, I want you to lift your hands together if you received that. That's what happens when the body of Christ comes together in unity. Instead of pulling against each other. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost. Instead of pulling against each other, we decide we're not going to do the pulling. We're going to let Him flow through us. Now lift up your hands to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that there will be an overflow. I pray that as this body has just watched an open illustration of the possibility and the potential of what can happen if we just let you flow through us. God, we don't have to make anything happen. We just have to be available. We have to put your, oh, hallelujah, come on, somebody. We just have to be willing to put our hands in your hands and let you not drag us, but let our life be surrendered to walk with you. Lord, to walk with you on Monday to the workplace, to walk with you on Tuesday to the appointments, to walk with you, not just asking you to walk with us, but a surrendered life that asks us, oh God, to surrender so that we might walk with you. Forgive us where our feet have been slow. Forgive us, oh God, where we have debated the cause. I pray for a baptism of love in this place. I've heard this said as a child standing near a big swimming pool. Take the plunge. I want you right now to release your hands and take one step, but don't see yourself stepping into something, but stepping into the ocean of His love. And when you step in, hallelujah, there's more of Him than there is of you. When you step into Him, every valley shall be exalted. When you step into Him, every mountain shall be made low. When you step into Him, every crooked place will be made straight. When you step into Him, every rough place can be made smooth. Hallelujah. Now, God, I pray that as we leave this place tonight, let us just walk with you. Hallelujah. Let us walk it out by allowing this scripture that we have prayed become a reality. And Lord, we pray, I pray. Lord, I'm not Paul, but I'm the pastor. I pray as Paul did. May we live to know the height, the width, the depth, and the breadth. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think. To him be glory now and forever worlds without end. Well, if you receive that seed into your life and faith, give him praise and then turn around and give somebody a heaven's hug and walk this thing out this week. We'll see you Sunday morning at 1030 ready to receive and to walk in the love of God. God bless you tonight.